chapter 60, 13, 13. We will discuss in this chapter diagnostic assessments. We'll be doing all the laboratory assessments that you would need to be aware of and diagnostic um, tools such as bladder scans, um, CT, MRIs. Laboratory test, creatinine is a waste product of protein or muscle breakdown. The level of creatinine in the blood is an indication of the kidney's ability to excrete waste. Serum creatinine is elevated only in renal disorders and does not increase until at least 50% or renal function is lost. So any elevation is important and is a better measurement of kidney function than BUN. And we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Unlike BUN, creatinine is not influenced by diet, hydration, nutritional status, or liver function. So that is the reason it's a better indicator because it doesn't have doesn't matter how much your urine is diluted or what you eat. If it's elevated, we got a kidney um, problem. Um, with normal functioning kidneys, the serum creatinine level varies with age, gender, body muscle mass, levels slightly higher in men than women, and that is due to the larger muscles men have. Increased level indicates renal impairment. Decreased levels may be caused by decreased muscle mass. If you have an elevated serum creatinine, always ask your patient about uh, non-prescription medications that they take, any type of supplements, vitamins like Ashburns or Advil, that can make it go elevated too. Blood urea nitrogen, which is your BUN test, is a general indicator of the kidney's ability to excrete urea nitrogen. And this is just an end product of protein metabolism in your liver. The liver must be functioning properly to produce the urea nitrogen. If a liver is dysfunctional, urea production is limited. Kidneys filter waste from blood, excrete waste in urine. BUN is not always elevated with kidney disease and is not the best sole indicator of kidney function. So creatinine clearance is the most, the, the one that you have to really pay attention to because any elevation in your creatinine, you got some kind of uh, kidney dysfunction. BUN is influenced by your diet, your hydration, nutritional status, liver function, and or rapid destructions of your red blood cells. Um, in addition to renal failure, factors that increase BUN are a high protein diet, especially with renal disease gastrointestinal bleeding, dehydration, some drugs such as chemo, uh, aspirin, diuretics, heavy duty antibiotics like genomycins, uh, tobramycin, morphine, steroids can do it also. BUN to serum creatinine ratio helps to determine whether kidney damage versus non-renal factors such as poor renal perfusion or dehydration are causing the elevated BUN. Normal ratio is 12 to 1 to 20 to 1, and this can vary according to the textbooks, and some may even say it's 10 to 1. Um, higher BUN to serum creatinine ratio, fluid volume deficits such as dehydration, You'll have low blood pressure, high protein dots can cause this, obstruction of the urinary tract, lower BUN to serum creatinine ratio, fluid volume excess, no change in the ratio, but increases in both levels, 
indicates renal impairment not related to dehydration or poor perfusion. And if you look on the bottom of page 1313, um, it's got the laboratory profile where you've got your kidney blood studies. This goes over your serum creatinine, your BUN, and then your BUN creatinine ratio. So kind of look over that, make sure you know those normal ranges, and then significance as to the abnormal uh, findings. All right, your analysis collected at the morning's first voiding, because other times may be too diluted, because you might have a client that might drink a lot of uh, fluids or water, and that's going to dilute it, so you're not going to get a good reading. So always the first morning void. Color should be pale, yellow, odor slight ammonia smell, and no uh, cloudiness or haziness. Specific gravity. This just measures the density or a concentration of urine as compared to water, which has a specific gravity of 1.0. Normal values is 1.005 to 1.03. Value decreases with age due to decreased ability to concentrate urine. Increased specific gravity. Um, indicates concentrated urine due to dehydration, decreased kidney blood flow or stress, some surgeries, some medications such as anesthetic drugs, morphine, oral diabetic meds can cause this. Decreased specific gravity indicates diluted urine that may be due to high fluid intake, diuretic drugs, diabetes insipidus, pH measures urine acidity or alkalinity, and below 7 is acid, and above 7 is alkalinic. Um, influenced by diet, high fruits and vegetables equals alkaline. Diet high in protein is more acidic. Presence of E. coli equals more acidic urine also. Urine specimens become more alkaline when they are left unrefrigerated for more than one hour. If there is a presence of bacteria or if they're left uncovered. So what you need to do as a nurse when you collect a specimen should be always covered, always refrigerated and delivered properly. So if you cannot get that specimen to the lab, you need to make sure that it's covered up, labeled correctly with your patient's information on it, and make sure that it is refrigerated till you can get it to the lab. And if you look on page 1314, this goes over what a urinalysis should look like. So make sure that you know that little box. Um, and then if you look on page 1315, this goes over collection of urine specimen, voided urine, how to collect a, 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 a specimen from a patient or client that is voiding. This should be a recall from your fundamentals, clean catch specimen, catheterized specimen, and 24-hour urine collection. So make sure that you go over that and you are where how to collect. All right, protein not normally present in urine. Protein urea may indicate infection or possible kidney damage. Glucose, when the blood glucose levels gets above 220, the renal threshold for reabsorption is exceeded and glucose is present in the urine. Patients with infection are diabetes mellitus. Glucose in urine will be found even if the blood glucose is normal. Ketones, results of incomplete metabolism of fatty acids. Fat used instead of glucose for cell energy. This is not normal in urine. Leucoesterase, this is just an enzyme in your WBCs, not normal in urine. This is how they check to see if you got a UTI. 
nitrates. This is just a chemical. If you find this, you've got a UTI. And culture and sensitivity, this must always be sterile, obtained by a clean catch or catheter, because you don't want any abnormal pathogens from your mistake. So it's always got to be a sterile specimen. All right, then you've got composite urine collection, 12 or 24-hour urine, and that is on page 1315. Now, make sure that you go over that and how to collect it. Creatinine clearance, this is calculated measure of glomerular filtration weight, your GFR. And, and your GFR is just a test that is used to check how well the kidneys are working. Specifically, it eliminates how much blood passes through those tiny filters in the kidneys, which they call glomerulus, each minute. Best indication of overall kidney function, usually done with a 24-hour urine collection. The calculation compares the urine creatinine level to the blood creatinine level. So a blood specimen must be collected also. And they will uh, compare the blood collection of serum creatinine versus your urine's creatinine. So they will compare the two. If you have a low GFR, you are at risk for fluid overload. Also avoid NSAIDs if you have a decreased GFR to prevent further damage to your kidneys. Then your urine electrolytes, this is just analyzed for levels such as your sodium, your chloride. Uh, normally the amount of sodium is excreted will equal the amount of sodium consumed. So remember, anytime a client has issues with their creatinine Bun is always asked about the medication, uh, such as over-the-counter ones, your ibuprofen, uh, naproxen. These meds are nephrotoxic. So anytime you've got an issue with creatinine or your BUN, always ask what over-the-counter meds do you take because a lot of patients don't understand that those could cause issues too. And just remember, when they're doing lab values and you got a high potassium, and remember your potassium is 3.5 to 5. Anytime you've got a high potassium level, you need to place that patient on a monitor because your potassium interferes with your heart. Uh, so make sure, especially... If you got a urine output that is low and their potassium goes up, you got to place that patient on a monitor. Other diagnostic test, bladder scan. This is a non-invasive method of measuring urine volume, usually for post-void residual portal ultrasound used to determine need for intermittent catheterization based on the amount of urine in the bladder, not time between casts. And if you look on page 1312, this is just an example of uh, what one looks like, but there are several different types. Um, always choose a male or female. Use a male icon when a woman has a hysterectomy. Use conduct, conducting jelly. You will place that on the uh, pubic bone area. It will beep when it is complete, and then you'll have a reading of how much urine is in the bladder. Always get two readings, and that way that you, you can almost be sure. And once you have the second reading, there's a place where you can print out the strip and that can actually go in the chart and it'll be part of the documentation of that patient. KUB, this test identifies shape, size, and relationship of the organs to the other parts of the kidney tract. CT, computed tomography. This measures kidney size and assessment for masses, stones, 
trauma, metastasis disease. It is a 3D information. The patient may be NPO, but always go by the doctor's orders. Some might be on a clear liquid. Doctor may order contrast to be used. Always assess for allergies when you have a patient receiving contrast. This test allows your doctor to look at your urinary system using a special dye, which they call the contrast median, and this shows up better on x-rays. The dye may be injected into one of your veins or by the mouth and travels through your bloodstream, kidneys, ureters, bladder, before being passed out in your urine. The dye helps to show your urinary system more clearly than an ordinary x-ray. Your doctor will be able to see how quickly and efficiently your urinary system is working and how well it's dealing with the fluid and the waste. Bowel prep is needed, allergy assessments, MPO or clear liquids diet, but always go by your doctor's orders. You need to know what kind of medication your, your client is on. Metformin or glucophage should be discontinued for at least 24 hours before the procedure and 48 hours post-procedure due to lactic acidosis, which is just a uh, physiological condition characterized by low pH in the body tissues. So if your patient is on glucophage, they need to stop it uh, at least 24 hours before this procedure, and then you'll need to do a good renal assessment before putting them back on. Because if you put them back on too soon and they don't have good renal function, you can damage that kidney even further. Post-procedure, drink plenty of fluids to help flush that dye out of the your system so it won't damage your kidneys. Cystograph, insert a catheter for dye insulation, usually done for trauma or injury. Afterwards, always monitor for infection and increase fluid intake. Um, Renograph or kidney scan is a small amount of radioactive material is used and it, and it is given IV. Um, ultrasonography or ultrasound, you'll be placed in a prone position. You'll have to have a full bladder. So sometimes if they're going down for this procedure, the nurse that is going to be taking care of your patient from specials or radi radiology will call up and speak to you and tell you to go ahead and put a catheter in. That, that is your order. So what they will use is use that catheter to instill fluid to make sure they have a full bladder. Sound waves reproduce images. They will identify masses, obstructions, or tumors. Renal angiography or angiograph. Catheter is placed through your femoral or axillary arteries into the renal artery or your aorta. Contrast is then injected. Angiograph evaluates renal blood flow in trauma situations to identify tumors or if you've got elevated hypertension, blood pressure. Pre-procedure laxative is given. Injection site is prepped. Pulses are found such as your femoral, your pedal, your radial. They are identified. This test has mostly been replaced by other imaging tests, such as renal scans, ultrasounds, or CT. It's rarely used by itself, but it's usually in combination of several to really get a good view of your kidney function. Cystoscope is used to identify obstructions, and they may correct it while they're in there and abnormalities of the bladder wall or urethral occlusions. Scope through your urethra into your bladder. They will visualize the bladder with a lighted tube and instill dye to visualize the bladder on the x-ray. Requires urinary catheter, catheterization temporarily for dye, dye installation into your bladder. 
X-rays are taken then. This is considered an operative procedure, so you gotta make sure that you have a consent signed. They may remove the bladder tumors while they're in there. Also, this can be used to enlarge prostate, which we'll get into that lecture at the end of this module. A VCUG, voiding cystourethrogram, the patient voids, and x-rays are taken during voiding to determine urine reflux into the ure ureter. Renal biopsy explain that a kidney biopsy can help to determine a cause of for unexplained renal problems and can help to direct or change therapy. Most renal biopsies are performed percutaneously, and that just means through the skin or other tissues using ultrasound or CT guidance. The client signs a informed consent. Clients are MPO for four to six hours before this procedure. Because of the risk of post-procedure bleeding, you always want to assess the coagulation studies, such as their platelet count, their APTT, their PT, and bleeding times are performed before this is done. After the percutaneous biopsy, the major risk is bleeding from the site. For 24 hours after the biopsy, monitor the dressing site, vital signs, look at that urine to see if you have any spillage of blood in the urine. Check the hemoglobin level, your hematocrit. Even if the dressing is dry and there is no hematoma, the client could be bleeding from the site, and internal bleed is not readily visible, uh, but it's suspected if the client starts complaining of flank pain, if they have a decreased blood pressure, decreased urine output, or any other signs of hypovolemic shock. And how would you know if the patient was bleeding on, on the inside you can't see? What you want to assess for, look at that blood pressure will be low. Your pulse is going to go up to kind of compensate for that bleeding. The client follows a plan of strict bed rest, lying in a supine position with a back roll for additional support for hours, for like two to six hours after the biopsy. Um, the head of the bed may be elevated and the client may resume oral intake of food and fluids. After bed rest, the client may have limited bathroom privileges if there is no evidence of bleeding. Chapter 61, we will start on 1344 and this will go over kidney stones. Urolithiasis. This just means the presence of a calculi or stones in the urinary tract. Stones often do not cause symptoms until they pass into the lower urinary tract where they can cause excruciating pain. If stones form in the kidney, it is called nephrolithiasis in the kidney, nephro. And if they form in the ureter, they are called ureterolithiasis. Formation of stones seems to involve in three certain conditions. The first one is slow urine flow. This is resulting in supersaturation of the urine with a particular elements such as calcium that first become crystallized and later forms a stone. The second one is damage to the lining of the urinary tract. This is abrasions from these crystals. And then the third one is decreased inhibitor substances in the urine that would otherwise prevent supersaturation and those crystal aggregation. The pain associated with urinal spasm is excruciating and may cause the patient to go into shock from stimulations of the nearby nerves. 
Hematuria, which is just bloody urine, may result from the damage to the ure urethral lining where that stone is trying to move and it's scratching on that lining. If the obstruction is not removed, urinary stasis can cause infection and impaired kidney function on the side of the blockage. As the blockage persists, hydronephrosis is just an enlargement of the kidney caused by the blockage of the urine, urine lower in the tract and filling the kidney with urine so it's not able to pass and the and permanent kidney damage may develop. If the stone is too large, the patient will have hydroureter. Urinary stasis, urinary retention, immobility, and dehydration all increase the risk of stone formation. All right, urolithiasis continued. Ask the patient about family history of stones, what type of diet they consume, how much fluid do they take, take or drink. If they have stones, ask about the treatment they received. Was the stone sent to the lab and analyzed? And what treatment did they receive when they had the stone? Some signs and symptoms that the client will have severe pain called renal colic. If you have flank pain, the stone is usually in the kidney or upper ureter. If the pain extends toward your abdomen, your scrotum, testes, vulva, the stone is usually in the ureter or bladder. When the stone is moving or there is an obstruction, that is when you have your worst pain. The pain becomes sudden and is unbearable. You will have nausea, vomiting, pallor, and will become very diaphoretic. Frequency and dysrhea occur when a stone reaches the bladder. Augurea is what they call scant urine output, and ana with an A, anurea, is absence of urine output. This usually suggests an obstruction and this is an emergency and must be treated to prevent kidney damage. Palpate to see if the patient has a distended bladder. The patient will be very pale, diaphoretic, with major pain. The patient may present with elevated blood pressure. Their temp will be elevated and pulse due to the infection. The blood pressure may decrease if the pain is severe enough and could cause the patient to go into shock. You need to collect your analysis and hematuria is usually seen, which will be a smoky or rusty color. RBCs are seen due to the trauma of the stone on the lining of the ureter, bladder, or urethra because remember, the patient will be in the pain when that stone is trying to move. And if the stone is large enough, <coughs> excuse me, it will be scratching on that lining as it's coming down. If you see urine that is cloudy and with an odor, that indicates infection. Then you will collect urine for a microscopic examination. And y'all know what that is. Look at your lab sheets. If your serum creatinine, phosphate, and uric acid is increased, this contributes to stone formation. There are several diagnostic tools that are used. The KUB, remember that's your kidney, ureters, and bladder, can be used. And we've already discussed these diagnostic tools. IV urogram, this is just an intravenous pyelogram. This test allows your doctor to look at the urinary system using that specific dye that shows up on the x-ray. The dye is injected into one of your veins and travels through your bloodstream, kidneys, ureters, and bladder before passing out in your urine. The dye helps to show your urinary system more clearly than on an ordinary x-ray. 
Your doctor will be able to see how quickly and efficiently your urinary system is working and how well it's dealing with the fluid and waste. CT scan is a three-dimensional image that can be used and then a renal ultrasound is used to create images from the sound waves. All right, the major intervention for the nurse is to relieve pain, prevent infection or any other obstructions. The doctor may order non-surgical or surgical approaches to assist with the kidney stone. The nurse's goal is to help with the passing of the stone and pain management. Opiate analgesics is needed for the first two to three days to help control the pain. Morphine or Dilaudid is usually given IV for fast relief. Tordol, which is an NSAID, is used in the acute phase and the risk for bleeding is increased. Now remember on Tordol, you can only use this or your patient can only be on this for five days due to the increase of bleeding. So it's your job to make sure your patient is not on this for more than five days. So then you can casually bring that up to your doctor. Um, they, uh, NSAIDs have an increased risk for kidney impairment due to the reduced perfusion. They have a high risk for bleeding. Make sure that you give the medication on a regular schedule to keep a constant level in the bloodstream that you may have to give your client a skin patch such as a duragesic patch because that'll help with uh, fall through pain. Always assess the pain level and document. Contemporary or alternative therapy, you might can have the patient try relaxation techniques, acupuncture, breathing techniques can be used along with pain medication. Assist the patient to a comfortable position, which is usually very hard to find. Strain urine, and if you find one, send to the lab to be analyzed because the composition of the stone is used for preventive treatment. Thysi diuretics, allopurinol combined with a high fluid intake will help increase urine volume, which will help with excretion of the stone. And if the stone does not pass in two months, it probably will not pass and the, pay, the doctor will have to probably do surgery to remove this. All right, drug therapy. Morphine is a potent opiate analgesic. Opiates not only suppress pain impulses, but also suppress respiratory and coughing by acting on the respiratory and cough centers in the medulla. So you have got to be very careful. Even if your patient is in pain, you got to monitor those vital signs. Look at that blood pressure, cause if that blood pressure is low or that respiratory rate is low, you can't give pain medication because it will just further depress it. Morphine is effective against acute pain resulting from acute myocardial infarctions and some cancers. This relieves uh, dyspnea resulting from pulmonary edema and may be used as a preoperative medication to, re to relieve anxiety. Although it is effective in relieving severe, severe pain, it can cause respiratory depression, orthostatic hypertension, uh, meiosis, which is just constriction of those pupils. It can cause urinary retention, constipation. So there, you've really got to assess your patient when you're giving them pain medication. Always assess and monitor vital signs, of course. If they're less than 10, you need to hold it, even if they are in pain. Record the patient's urine output, check bowel sounds, check older adults for alertness and orientation because confusion is a side effect and you will need to make sure those side rails are up and you keeping them safe. Check for pupil changes 
encourage patient to report drowsiness by taking this because you don't want them to have orthostatic hypertension. Um, teach patients to report difficulty breathing. Always have naloxone, your Narcan available because that's an antidote. Encourage patients not to use alcohol or central nervous system depressants when they're taking this. All right, Dilaudid, hydromorphone. Um, the analgesic effect is approximately six times more potent than morphine with fewer hypnotic effects and less GI distress. They use a lot more Dilaudid in the hospitals now than morphine. This opiate has a faster onset and shorter duration of action than morphine. It can be given orally, rectally, or sub-Q, IM, IV. When given IV, dilution of each dose with five milliliters of sterile water or normal saline is preferred to kind of help further dilute it, but you can give it straight. Um, Respiration should be monitored. Other side effects include orthostatic hypertension. So you want to make sure when you're getting them up out of the bed, let them sit on the side for a little bit to get their self oriented and then stand them up because you don't want them to hit the floor. Uh, dizziness, weakness, confusion. So always look for that. Um, use opiate analgesics and contradicted for patients uh, with head injuries. So always ask or see what is going on before you just push morphine. Because if they've been in a car accident or they have fallen, you can't give it to them if they've got a head injury. Um, Tordol is a non-opiate analgesic. This is used for short-term pain, five days or less may cause dizziness, drowsiness, edema, headache, can be given by mouth, IM or IV. All right, urinary tract spasms resulting from infection or injury can be relieved with antispasmodics such as your oxybutin or ditropin, and this can treat urinary incontinence and neurogenic or overactive bladders. This can cause drowsiness, dizziness, headaches, caution in patients with GERD, cardiac, renal, hepatic, and prostate hypertrophy, and those who smoke tobacco or wear contact lenses. Uh, probanthine may cause headaches, dizziness, blurred vision, confusion, palpation, urinary retention. So when you're giving these antispasmodic drugs, you need to really be able to monitor your patient also. And that's with any medication that you give your patients. You need to know why you're giving it, what are the side effects, and you should come back and assess them. All right, allopurinol, this is usually used for gout or hyperuricemia, renal calculus. It may cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Obtain a medical history of gastric, renal, or cardiac disorders. Record the urine output, of course. Monitor that lab test, BUN, serum creatinine. Report GI symptom, gastric pain. Administer these drugs with food to allevi alleviate uh, gastric distress. Instruct patients to increase fluid intake. Uh, warn patients to avoid alcohol and caffeine because this can increase uric acid levels. Suggest that patients not take large doses of vitamin C while taking allopurinol. Kidney stones may occur. Lipotripsy. Extracorporeal shock wave lipstertripsy, which is ESWL, uses sound, laser, or dry shock wave energy to break up the stone into smaller, smaller fragments. The patient will undergo what they call conscious sedation 
which means they will put them in la-la land. They will not put them to sleep. Um, this is used when a stone is too large to pass. The patient lies on the table with a lip to trip to aimed at the stone, which is located uh, by fluoroscopy. And this is just an imaging technique commonly used by doctors to obtain real-time moving images of the entire internal structures of the client. The nurse will apply anesthetic cream 45 minutes before the procedure. The procedure will take about 45 minutes to complete. Afterwards, you always want to strain the urine to see if there's any fragments. And, and if you find some, you need to send them to the lab. Bruising may occur on the effective side after the ESWL. You may need to apply ice to that area because this can help with the discomfort. Teach the patient to take all of his or her antibiotics and drink three liters of fluid a day. This will help push that fragments out. Sometimes a stent may be placed in the ureter before the procedure because this will help with the passage of the stone. And you will be placed, the client will be placed on a, a cardiac monitor because when they, they hit this or the laser beam uh, or dry shot, it could cause them to go into cardiac arrest and they want to make sure that they can keep that monitor there. If the stone is too large to pass, the patient will have to undergo surgery. Minimum invasive surgery, the first one is stenting. A small tube is placed in the ureter. The stents dilates the ureter and helps with the passage of the stone. Stenting helps prevent the stone from contacting the mucosus lining, which will reduce pain, bleeding, and infection risk. The patient may have a Foley cath. Retrograde ureteroscope. This is an endoscopy procedure. The ureteroscope is passed through the ureter and bladder into the ureter. Once the stone is seen, it is removed using a grasping basket, forceps or loops, and on the slide you can actually see one of those tools that could be used to grab that stone and pull it out. Lithotripsy also can be performed through the ureteroscope. A Foley cath may be placed to facilitate passage of the stone fragments through the urethra. Percutaneous Urtolithotomy or nephrolithotomy is the removal of a stone in the ureter or kidney through the skin. The patient lies prone or on the side and receives local and general anesthetic. The physician identifies the entry point with a fluoroscopy and then passes a needle into the collecting system of the kidney. Once a track has been made in the kidney, other equipment such as an intracorporal, which just means inside the body, ultrasound or laser lithotriptor can be used to break up and remove the stone. An endoscopy with a special attachment to grafts and extract the stone can be used. Often a nephrostomy tube is left in place at first to prevent the stone fragments from passing through the normal urinary tract. Provide routine nephrostomy tube care, clean with normal saline and apply a drain sponge with sterile technique. Monitor the patient for complications after the procedure. Complications include bleeding at the site or through the tube, a pneumothorax or infection can occur. When other stone removal attempts have failed or when risk of lasting injury to the ureter or kidney is possible, a open 
ureter o lithotomy, which means into the ureter, pila lithotomy into the kidney pelvis, or nephrolithotomy into your kidney procedure may be performed. These procedures are used for large and impacted stone, and any time your patient presents with an elevated temp after these procedures, you need to notify that physician ASAP. Drainage from nephrostomy tube should be just like voiding. If there is a decrease in urine, check for kinks, abdominal swelling, or in the vital signs. All right, preoperative. This is like any other preoperative procedure. You always want to explain the procedure in detail to your patient. And yes, that is the doctor's job, but you are there just to get the consent signed and to reinforce what the doctor says. Now, remember, if that patient or client is very confused on what they are having done, you need to call that doctor and tell them that they need to come back and talk with that client again because it's not your job to describe and tell what type of procedure it is going to happen. You can reinforce that, but that is a doctor's job. Explain what they will expect during the procedure. Are they going to have any drains or incisions, incentive spirometer, all that kind of stuff you need to explain in detail. They'll be MPO. They will have to have a good bowel prep before they go down for surgery. Operative care, sometimes they will have a large flank incision, and you can see that on the screen, or they might have a pin rose drain, which you can see it there. Now, remember, a pin rose drain is an open drain. It will be drained the entire time. So you'll need to make sure that you assess that dressing because that drain is going to uh, let that fluid come out of the incision onto the dressing and you're, it's going to be saturated and you're going to have to change that to keep your patient dry. Sometimes they might have to have a nephrostomy tube and remember that nephrostomy tube goes straight into your kidneys. It'll be on the side and it will drain urine just like it does from a regular catheter. Or they might have a urethral stent. I will bring in some of these drains and let you put your hands on them and look at them during class lecture. All right, post-operative care. You always want to assess your patient, of course, so you want to make sure their vital signs, urine output, their level of consciousness, IV fluid, all that kind of good stuff. You're going to do your good assessment postoperatively. You're going to monitor for bleeding, of course. Um, you're going to look at their fluid intake. You're going to strain that urine and any dietary changes that needs to occur. All right, infection prevention. You will be given antibiotics, of course. Drug therapy is the most common intervention. Amino glycosides are used. And if you look at your handout that is in your handout package, you can see amino glycoside toxicity. These drugs are nephro and ototoxic, so you're going to have to do peak and troughs on them. Now, remember, peak and troughs are what they will look and see how your body is tolerating that potent antibiotic. They'll do a peak and trough. And what peak means, that is the highest level that drug is in your blood system. And the trough is the lowest level that antibiotic is in your blood system. So a lot of times they might say, do a trough on the third dose or the fourth dose. And you will actually have that on your MAC system that will show you trough. So if you're given a heavy duty antibiotic uh, you, and it has it 30 minutes to an hour before you have to give that antibiotic, we need to make sure that lab has come drawn the blood 
and they have gave us a reading back on what the trough level is before we give our antibiotics. And I'll go into further detail in this in lecture. All right, so ampicillin is a broad spectrum penicillin and are used to treat both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. This can be used also for meningitis, endocarditis, septicemia, skin infection, respiratory, urinary tract infection. So you need to make sure um, that you always monitor the peak and trough levels. Uh, always look at the antibiotics to make sure that you are given the correct antibiotic and the correct dosage. Um, a lot of times they will do what they call culture and sensitivity tests. And what this is, remember all culture and sensitivity tests must be sterile. So they will send it down to the lab and they will see which antibiotic is sensitive to whatever pathogen that you have growing in your system. And that is the one that they will put you on. Sometimes they will even put you on, uh, they will get the specimen, send it to the lab, but they might go ahead and start you on an antibiotic. But then when they get the results back, they might change that antibiotic to another one. And it's due to, because whatever sensitive to your your culture and sensitivity that's what they will uh, put the patient on uh, when the patient has a struvite stone if you will look on page 1347 uh, struvite this is just a magnesium ammonia phosphate uh, you're you're going to have periodic long-term monitoring of urine for infection is needed for these type stones. And if you look on the slide, that one that's got all the little horns and sharp points, that is a struvite stone. So just think of that trying to move through your tubes, how it's going to be hurting. Uh, urine cultures are checked monthly for three months and then quarterly for one year. Drugs that prevent bacteria from splitting urea. And this is just a waste product by the body after metabolizing a uh, protein. You will be placed on lithostat or hydrea are often prescribed on a long-term basis for patients with struvite stones. Serum creatinine levels are measured when the patient is on lithostat because this is measuring the serum creatinine is useful and inexpensive method of evaluating renal dysfunction. This drug is stopped if creatinine levels are above two. Creatinine clearance is increased in pregnancy resulting in lower serum levels Make sure the patient has adequate caloric intake and fluid intake of two to three liters a day to keep the urine a light color. Always monitor eyes and O's, of course. Prevention of obstruction. A high intake of fluids three liters or more a day and carefully measure of I's and O's. Fluid intake sufficient to provide a diluted urine helps prevent dehydration, promotes flow of urine, and decreases the chance of crystal forming a stone. Drug therapy to prevent obstruction depends on what is causing stone formation and the type of stone form. Drugs to treat hypercalcuria, high levels of calcium in the urine, include thiazide diuretics. And this is one of the first thiazide uh, chlorothiazides was marketed in 1957. That's a long time ago. And was followed a year later by hydrochlorothiazide. And there's a lot of patients that are that is on that one. Thiazide acts on the distal convoluted renal tubular 
beyond the loop of Henley to pr promote calcium, chloride, and water excretion. Thiazides are used to treat hypertension and peripheral edema. Thiazide diuretics are used primarily for patients with normal renal function. If the patient has a renal disorder and creatinine clearance is less than 30 milliliters a minute, the effectiveness of thiazide diuretics is greatly decreased. Thiazide causes a loss of sodium, potassium, and magnesium, but they promote calcium reabsorption. Hydrochlorothiazide, this is used to increase urine output and to treat hypertension, edema, heart failure, nephrotic syndrome, and ascites. Side effects is dizziness, headaches, weakness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, blurred vision. For patients with chronic gout, allopurinol helps prevent the formation of uric acid stones. And if you look on page 1345, 1345 at the bottom, that table 616, this actually goes on different types of stones. And you can see where it's got struvite stone there. You got the uric acid ones and it's got dietary interventions and then the rationale. That is a very good table for you to know. Nutritional therapy depends on the type of stone form. Uh, encourage exercise such as walking because this promotes passage of the stone uh, and reduce bone calcium absorption. St always strain the urine, of course. And then look on page 1349. This goes over patient and family education for urinary calculi. You always need to finish your entire prescription of antibiotics. Uh, remember to balance rather regular exercise and sleep. You may return to work two days to six weeks after surgery, depending on what your physician has told you. And depending on the type of stone that you had, they might restrict some of your nutritional status. So always go by what your physician says. So finish reading over that uh, chart or table. It's very, very good. All right, urethral cancer. Most urethral cancer is found in the bladder and those are confined to the bladder. Mucosis are treated with simple excision whereas those that, that are deeper but not into the muscle layer are treated with excision plus extra visceral inside the bladder chemotherapy. Cancer that has spread deeper into the bladder muscle layer is treated with more extensive surgery, often a radical cystectomy, which is removal of the bladder and surrounding tissues with some type of urinary diversion, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy are used in addition to surgery. If untreated, the tumor invades surrounding tissues such as the liver, lung, and bone, and ultimately leads to death. Exposure to toxins, especially chemicals used in hairdressing, rubber, paint, electric cable, uh, textile industries increase the risk of bladder cancer. The greatest risk factor for bladder cancer is tobacco use. So quit smoking. Physical assessment, uh, recognizing those cues, general health, gender, age, do you smoke or does someone in your household smoke? Because secondhand smoking is just as bad or worse. Occupation that the client does and describe their urine characteristics. Clinical manifestation. The nurse 
needs to observe the patient's urine for color. Remember, blood is usually the first sign of bladder cancer. Send to the lab for a UA or microscopic analysis. Ask, do they have any pain when they urinate or what is their frequency or urgency? Psychosocial assessment, assess their response to the news of cancer, cancer coping strategies, family involvement. Diagnostic test, UA will be ordered and report will show hematuria. Bladder biopsy may be ordered and this is done for staging purposes. Cystoscopy with retrograde urography, urography may be ordered to evaluate painless hematuria. A CT or MRI may be ordered. Interventions, patients with bladder cancer will usually undergo surgery for removal of the tumor. This will help the doctor stage diagnosis what type of cancer it is and then the correct treatment will be ordered such as chemo or radiation. All right, surgical management, preoperative care, non-surgical management, multi-agent chemotherapy is useful in prolonging life after distance metastasis has occurred but rarely results in a cure. Radiation therapy is also useful in prolonging life. So always patient education is very important. Um, you need to tell them what type of surgery, what type of urinary diversion. And remember, the doctor needs to explain all this first, then you as a nurse can reinforce it. All right, surgical, the staging and type of cancer will determine the type of surgery the patient will have and consideration will be on the patient's health status. Complete bladder removal, with, which will be a cystectomy with additional removal of surrounding muscles and tissue offers the best chance of cure for large invasive bladder cancers. There are four alternatives are used after a cystectomy and we'll get into each one of these. The first one will be a ileo conduit. Then you have continent pouch. Then you have a bladder reconstruction also known as neobladder. And you can have a ureter sigmoid ostomy. The goal is for the patient to have a positive attitude about body image and a positive self image. Use educational counseling to ensure understanding about self-care practices, methods of pouching, control of urine drainage, and management of odor. Inform the patient of tubes they will have after surgery. Don't let them wake up and be surprised because that will freak them out. Always tell them what they're going to have or might have. All right, operative procedures. A T-U-R-B-T is just a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor or a partial cystectomy is performed for small, early superficial tumors. In a partial segment cystectomy, a portion of the bladder is removed. This procedure is used when there is only a single isolated bladder tumor. And remember, a complete cystectomy is when they remove the entire bladder. Ileoconduit, this is one type of procedure. The ureters are surgically placed in the ileum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And urine is collected in a pouch on the skin around the stoma. So you will have a stoma that will come out 
and a pouch will be attached there. You can use a continent reservoir if your bladder is surgically removed, a segment of your bladder is removed and used to create a storage pouch that is then attached inside your abdomen. There are two types of internal continent reservoirs. Abdominal diversion reservoir, the pouch inside the abdomen connects to an opening, which they call a stoma, in the skin. This pouch is called a urostomy. You will need to pass a catheter through the opening to release urine several times a day and during night also. Orthotopic diversion, if your urethra was not removed as part of the cystectomy, you may be able to have this type of procedure. The pouch is attached to your ureters at one end and your urethra at the other. This allows you to pass urine through the same opening as you did before surgery. Some people may need to use a catheter to release, to release the urine. Continent reservoirs eliminate the need for a urine storage bag to be worn on the outside of your body, as with the ileo conduit. More often, continent reservoirs or neobladders are being used because many clients do not want that bag on the outside of their skin. Cutaneous ureteostomies is a surgical procedure that detaches one or both ureters from the bladder and brings them to the surface of the abdomen for the formation of a stoma to allow passage of urine. All right, this is the ileo conduit. And remember, this method of urinary diversion uses the intestines. Uh, some of their tissue, the ureters are implanted in a section of the dissected ileum. This section is sutured closed on one end and the other end is drawn through the abdominal wall, right lower quadrant to create a stoma. The patient wears a patch pouch to collect the urine. And if you look on page 1352, this will go over these types of reservoirs. All right, this is a continent reservoir. And remember, this is the one where your bladder has been surgically removed and they make you a bladder and you don't have to wear a pouch on the outside. Or you've got the cutaneous uh, ureterostomy, and this is where you have the, the uh, bladder removed, and then you have a stoma that has been created where you have to wear a pouch. All right, post-operative care, you will have what they call a ET, Therapist, which is just an enteral ostomy uh, therapist, they will come in, they will work with you on pouching, how to change it, skin care, uh, but they will just come in and assist you till you are able to take care of yourself and then go home with it. So ET nurses focus on skin and wound care plus the drainage. A cox pouch is just a continent reservoir or internal continent reservoir. A catheter is used to drain urine from the pouch through an abdominal stoma. This is a easy and painless process. Self-catheterization for pouch irrigation to prevent mucus plug formation is required. So they might invent you a little pouch there but it doesn't have the stimulations like your normal uh, voiding patterns, so you will have to do self-catheterization. A neobladder is a pouch that connects the urethra 
so that natural voiding is possible. Your bladder has just made you a new bladder. This new bladder doesn't have the same sensation nerve pattern as you normally did before the removal. So for the first few months after surgery, you should urinate by a clock rather than waiting for the urge to go to the bathroom. After the Foley cath has been removed in the clinic, three weeks after surgery, you should urinate every two hours, day and night for the first week. During the second week, up it to three hours. And in third week, you can stretch it out three to four hours. You should continue to get up twice a night to empty your bladder. Um, and remember, postoperatively, if a patient has low blood pressure, you may have to give uh, a normal saline bolus. And what this means, if they're not urinating after surgery or they got a low blood pressure, they will give maybe a 500 or a 1,000 milliliter bolus uh, to the patient over an hour. So to get kind of like a kick start of that urine to start producing. Now, when you give a bolus, you need to always assess your patient's respiratory because they could get fluid over, overload. And then if that happens, you will need to lower that bolus rate because you don't want them to get fluid overload. All right, community-based care. When you're teaching about going home with one of these diversions, you need to make sure they know all the do's and don'ts. Avoid foods that are known to produce gas if the urinary diversion uses the intestinal tract. When intestinal production of gas is excessive, flatus can induce incontinence. In collaboration with the ET therapist, demonstrate external pouching applications, how to take care of their skin because your urine is very acidic, pouch care, methods of adhesions for that wafer, and drainage mechanisms. If a Cox pouch has been created, teach the patient how to use a catheter to drain the pouch. For all instructions, observe at least one return demonstration by the patient or the caregiver. So what you're going to be doing as a nurse, you're going to be demonstrating how to take care of the wafer, how to empty that bag. But then before they start to go home, you need to let them return that demonstration to you to make sure they know how to take care of it. And then you need to document very carefully with that. Um, Self-image, body image, sexual functioning, and self-esteem. You need to make sure that they understand all what's going on. And if a male has had a bladder removed, a cystectomy, it can cause impotence in men, and you need to inform them this. But there are medications that they can take to help with this. And if you have a patient that has had kidney removed, you need to teach them to avoid any contact sports because they only have one kidney. All right, bladder trauma can be caused by penetrating or blunt injury. A seat belt may compress the bladder hard enough if they've been in a car accident. Surgical interventions repairing the bladder wall and peritoneal membrane may have Penrose drains or a Foley cath. Uh, in some instances, vaginal or rectal fistulas may develop. Psychosocial support is critical for patients who have sustained traumatic injuries. Refer them to counseling resources to assist them in dealing with the psychosocial issues that they will encounter. Chapter 62, we will be discussing the patient with renal disorders, how to recognize, and what are the nursing interventions. Pyelonephritis. This is, includes your renal pelvis, your tubes, and cystic 
interstitial tissues of one or both of your kidneys. It's frequently secondary to reflux, may be acute, which will be active bacterial infection, or chronic, repeated upper urinary tract infections. Acute, you will see your kidney will be enlarged. Abscesses may be noted in the renal capsule. Fibrosis and scar tissue develop from the inflammation. Eventually will lead to a trophy and destruction of the tubulars and glomerulus. Reflux of infected urine from the bladder into the ureters and kidney is responsible for most cases of chronic poly polynephritis. <coughs> Repeated infections can create scarring of tissue, a change in the blood vessels, glomerular or tubular structures, and this will cause a elevation of your blood pressure. Uh, this causes reduction in renal function. Some signs and symptoms, patients are acutely ill, chills, fever, leukocytosis, pyuria, bacteria, flank pain, labs, you'll collect the UA and CNS and send it to the lab. You'll get blood cultures to see just where the infections are coming from. Uh, do need to be real careful about your mycin antibiotics because remember these are very nephro and ototoxic. Non-surgical management, treatment of um, uncomplicated acute polynephritis is treated as outpatient unless they are dehydrated. Interventions will include drug therapy, such as acetaminophen is preferred over NSAIDs because it does not interfere with kidney function. Tylenol, non-opiate analgesics such as aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen are less potent than opiate analgesics and are used to treat mild to moderate cases. Non-opiates are usually purchased over the counter. So that's the reason it's very important for you to always ask when you're doing your assessment on your patient, what over the counter meds do you take? Do not get these mixed up with NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These have an analgesic effect as well as an antipyretic and anti-inflammatory actions. NSAIDs such as aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen can be purchased as over-the-counter also. <coughs> Nutritional guidance, adequate calories for healing, fluid therapy at least two liters a day, and patient teaching always teach them to empty bladder every two to three hours while awake. The physician will order broad spectrum antibiotics. Then after the urine culture is obtained and sent to the lab, a specific antibiotic will be ordered for the pathogen that it is sensitive to. Instruct patients to complete their entire antibiotic therapy, even if they feel better. And that is a problem that we're running into because a lot of clients, they'll say, well, I feel better, so I'm going to just save them till later. They need to take their whole regimen to kill that pathogen, not just knock it down. Surgical management are used to correct the obstruction or to remove the source of infection. Pyelolithotomy, remember this is stone removal from the kidney. Nephro, nephro, nephrectomy is removal of the kidney or a urethral uh, diversion. Health teaching, um, drug therapy, of course, because they've got to know how to take their medication balance between rest and activities, and their coping strategies. To help prevent acute polynephritis, always teach your patient to empty the bladder more and drink more fluid. Acute glomerulonephritis. This is just an inflammation of your glomerular capillaries. Is primary a disease of children? 
older than two years of age but can occur at any age. Usually a beta hemolytic streptococcal infection of the throat by two to three weeks. It can also follow infantigo, acute viral infection, hepatitis B, or HIV. These are all contributing factors. Assessment, recent infections, skin, upper respiratory tract, inspect their skin and assess for edema, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, assess for crackles in the lungs and neck vein distension, ask about any change in their urination patterns, assess for color of urine, usually the patient would describe urine as a smoky, reddish, brown, or color, cola colored. Weigh the patient, need to collect a baseline for their blood pressures. Elevated blood pressure is due to sodium and fluid retention. They may complain of feeling fatigue and a lack of energy. Lab assessments, UA shows hematuria or proteinuria. Collect early morning specimen because the urine is more acidic and form elements are more intact. The doctor may order a 24-hour urine. The BUN is usually elevated. A renal biopsy is usually performed and will give you a precise diagnosis and determine the prognosis for the client. Interventions. Management of infections begin with antibiotic therapy, such as penicillin. And penicillin is a natural antibacterial agent obtained from a mold genesis penicillin. This was introduced to the military during World War II and is considered to have saved many lives. It became widely used in 1945 and was considered the miracle drug. Um, always ask about their allergies, stress good hand washing, stress the importance of completing the entire dose, Prevention of complication is a major nursing responsibility. With fluid overload, hypertension, and edema, diuretics and sodium and water restrictions are prescribed. The usual fluid intake is equal to the 24-hour output plus five to 600 milliliters. So whatever they're taking in, that's what you want to put back in plus five to 600 milliliters. Patients with augurea may have serum potassium and BUN levels elevated. So potassium and protein intake may be restricted to prevent hyperkalemia and uremia, which is just an excess of nitrogen in products of protein and amino acid metabolism in the blood as a result of elevated BUN. Nausea and vomiting indicates that urema is present. Dialysis is ordered if the protein cannot be controlled. Plasma paresis, which is just removing and filtering a plasma to eliminate those antibodies may be attempted. Patient education Maintain a restful environment, drug therapy, dietary or fluid restrictions, weigh and take blood pressure daily at the same time and record. You will know if the treatment plan is working if the patient loses weight. Chronic Lameria nephritis. All right, the patho, it develops over 20 to 30 years. Mild proteinuria or hematuria, elevated blood pressure, fatigue, edema are the only signs and symptoms. The change in the kidney tissue is because of the elevated BP. Infections that you have had are poor blood flow. Chronic Glomerulonephritis 
always leads to kidney failure are an assessment and where we recognize our cues, ask about their health issues, their boarding patterns and color, ask if there is any change in memory and the ability to concentrate. This is due to the increase of waste products in the blood. They'll be complaining of itching, listen to the lungs, observe their rate, depth, listen to their heart, Assess for edema of foot and ankles, you'll find pitting edema. Observe for slurred speech, ataxia, tremors, asterictus, which is a tremor of the wrist when the wrist is extended, sometimes said to resemble a bird flapping its wings. These signs and symptoms are due to uremic buildup. Diagnostic assessment, urine output will decrease. UA will show protein urea. Glomerular filtration rate is low. Serum creatinine in bud is elevated. Your potassium is not excreted with augurea. On x-rays, your kidneys will be smaller than normal. A renal biopsy is done when the patient presents with blood and protein in the urine. In advanced diseases, a biopsy will not be performed when the kidneys are too small because they are scared they might further damage that kidney. Nephrotic syndrome. Common causes is caused by different disorders that damage the kidney. The damage leads to the release of too much protein in the urine. It is an immune or inflammatory process such as diabetes mellitus, systemic lupus. And remember, systemic lupus is just an autoimmune disease. It's characterized by production of unusual antibodies in the blood, multiple myeloma, Signs and symptoms of nephrotic syndrome is a group of symptoms that include protein in the urine, low blood protein levels, high cholesterol levels, high triglycerol levels, and swelling in the face and around the eyes, which they call periorbital. And if you look on the slide, you can see the swelling and edema of the eyes. And if you look on page 1362, this will go over some of your key features. Treatment, identify the cause by a renal biopsy. Steroids are given, ACE inhibitors to decrease protein loss in the urine. Diet changes. Weigh patient daily due to weight gain, mild diuretics and sodium restriction to help control edema and hypertension, increased protein intake, normal range of serum albumin is 3.5 to 5.5. If the glomerular filtration rate is normal, dietary intake of protein is needed. If it is decreased, protein intake must be decreased. Nephrosclerosis. This is just thickening in the nephron blood vessels resulting in narrowing of the vessel lumen. With the narrowing of these vessels, you will have kidney tissue hypoxia. The higher your blood pressure, the better chance of having, having kidney damage. Teach the patient about the disease and how to prevent it. Take blood pressure medicine as prescribed. The doctor may have ordered more than one blood pressure med. Um, ACE inhibitors are used a lot. Diuretics can be ordered to maintain fluid and electrolyte balances. When the patient is on potassium sparing diuretics, 
always monitor for hyperkalemia, elevated potassium levels. Polycystic kidney disease is a genetic disorder in which fluid-filled cysts develop in nephrons. It is abnormal cell division, which results in progressive kidney enlargement. It looks like clusters of grapes. And if you look on the slide, you can see a normal kidney, what it looks like versus a PKD kidney. Over time, growing cysts damage the glomerular and tubular membranes and the cystic kidney enlarges, becomes the, it can become the size of a football up to 10 pounds or more. Then the cysts will fill with fluid and, it, and enlarge. Then the kidney function becomes less effective which urine formation and waste elimination will be impaired. If you look on page 1364, we'll go over your key features. Pain is usually the first signs and symptoms the patient will come into the doctor for. Inspect the abdomen because distended abdomen is common as the cystic kidney swell and push the abdominal contents forward. Use gentle abdominal palpation because tissues may be tender and palpation is uncomfortable. The patient also may have flank pain as a dull ache or as a sharp and intermittent discomfort. When a cyst ruptures, the patient may have bright red color, color, color urine and Infection is suspected if the urine is cloudy or foul smelly, or if there is dysrhea, which is pain on urination. Most patients with PKD have high blood pressure. Control of hypertension is a top priority because proper treatment can disrupt the process that leads to further kidney damage, as well as avoid complications such as a stroke from the elevated blood pressure. Cysts may also occur in the liver and blood vessels. The incidence of cerebral aneurysms is higher in patients with PKD. Aneurysms may rupture, causing bleeding and sudden death. Kidney stones, heart valve problems, left ventricular hypertrophy can occur in many patients with PKD. An ultrasound is used to diagnose PKD, but the definite diagnosis test is an MRI. A finding of five or more kidney cysts on MRI is diagnostic of PKD. They will determine the disease progression and see how big the kidney is by the MRI and CT. You will see protein in the urine from the urinalysis, which indicates a decline in kidney function. Hematuria may be gross or microscopic. If you see bacteria, that means infection, so then you will need to collect a UA CNS. Then as your kidney function declines, serum creatinine and BUN levels rise. With further decline, creatinine clearance decreases and your GFR is low. Genetic testing is not routinely performed for diagnostic assessments of PKD. It may be considered for patients who have atypical imaging findings or for those with symptoms who have no family history of PKD. Currently, no treatments are effective in extending kidney function. Supportive interventions are management of hypertension of pain, reducing complication from infection and constipation, and slowing disease progression, of course. To prevent constipation, teach the patient who has adequate urine output to consume two to three liters of fluid a day, maintaining that good dietary fiber intake 
and exercise regularly. And if you look on page 1365, this goes over patient education. These are very good bullets. Measure and record the blood pressure and it, it's different changes. You need to notify your healthcare provider, weigh yourself, on the same scales, same time of day, in the same clothing as possible. Notify your provider if you have headaches that won't go away or any visual disturbances, because these are symptoms of a stroke or bleeding in the brain. Uh, those are some very good, good points. Hydronephrosis, hydroureter, and urethral strictures. Hydronephrosis and hydroureter are problems of urinary outflow obstructions. Urethra strictures obstruct urine outflow. Prompt recognition and treatment are critical to preserving kidney function. Hydronephrosis is caused by obstruction in the upper part of the urethra, ureter, excuse me, that causes urine to collect in the kidney, causing kidney enlargement. And you can see the hydronephrosis on, on the slide. It's got a stone and it's causing that kidney to enlarge. Blood vessels and renal tubulars can be damaged extensively in a matter of hours. Hydroureter is similar, but obstruction is lower in the urinary tract. Ureter dilation occurs above the obstruction. Urethral stricture obstructions is a low in the urinary tract causing bladder distension before hydroureter and hydronephrosis. Problems in all of the above arise from the damage they cause to the kidney tissue. GFR is a test used to check how well the kidneys are working. Specifically, it eliminates how much blood passes through the tiny filters in the kidneys. Decreases or ceases can result in kidney failure. Nitrogen waste products such as your urea, creatinine, or uric acid, and your electrolytes, your potassium, your sodium chloride, are retained and cause an acid-base imbalance. Causes of hydronephrosis, hydroureter, or tumors, stones, some type of trauma, structural defects, and fibrosis, which is scarring. Assessment, recognizing those cues, Flank pain, urinary patterns, urinalysis may have bacteria and WBCs in them. BUN and serum creatinine increases with decreased GFR. A CT can show obstruction. Interventions remove causes of stricture, such as the stone by cystoscopy or retrograde urogram. After stone, stone removal, a stent may be placed to help with urine flow, and then in two or three weeks, that stent will be removed. Radiological nephrostomy tube can be placed, which will divert urine externally and prevents further damage to the kidneys. And pre-op, they will be NPO for 46 hours. They will do clotting studies, of course. And then that procedure, they'll be placed in a prone procedure. They'll have local anesthetics, needle inserted into the kidney, and catheter placed, which remains in the kidney and connected to a drainage bag. It relieves pressure in the kidney and prevents further damage. Remains in place until obstruction is resolved. Follow-up care, you want to monitor the amount of drainage. If drainage decreases or patient has back pain, check for any clot or dislodged tube and notify your healthcare provider immediately. Monitor site for leaking urine or blood. Urine may be blood tinged for the first 24 hours and gradually return to normal. 
and always monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. Diabetic nephropathy, diabetes mellitus is a leading cause of end-stage kidney disease. Albuminuria indicates the need for follow-up and possible biopsy. Avoid contrast dyes, of course, because that could harm your kidneys and amino glycosides, which is those mycin drugs, because those are odo and nephrotoxic. Renal cell carcinoma, also known as, as andriocarcinoma of the kidney. Systemic effects occurring with renal cell carcinoma are called paraneoplastic syndromes. Patients will have anemia, or erythrocytosis, which is defined as an excessive amount of erythrocytes or red blood cells. The cause of the anemia and erythrocytosis are related to the kidney cell production of erythroproietin, which is a hormone that regulates red blood cell production. At times, the tumor cells produce large amounts of erythroproietin, causing erythrocytosis. Other times the tumor cells destroys the erythropoietin producing kidney cells and anemia results then. Hypertension may result from increased blood levels of renin. Your parathyroid hormones produced by the tumor cells can cause hypercalcemia. Complications include metastasis and urinary tract obstruction. The cancer usually spreads to the adrenal gland, liver, lungs, long bones, and the other kidney. Your sedimation rate, commonly hematological test, and it measures for inflammation. Assessment, recognize cues. Right, the first thing you always want to Assess the patient history, known risk factors such as smoking, chemical exposures, <coughs> weight loss, changes in urine, color, abdominal flank, abdominal or flank, discomfort or fever. Ask whether any other family members has ever been diagnosed with cancer of the kidney, bladder, ureter, prostate gland, or uterus, or ovary. Physical assessment and clinical manifestation. Obvious blood in the urine in a kidney mass that can be palpated. Ask about pain, is it dull or aching? Inspect the flank area, checking for asymmetrical or an obvious bulge. An abdominal mass may be felt through gentle palpation. Bloody urine is a late common sign. Blood may be visible as bright red flakes or clots, or the urine may appear smoky or color code, cola colored. Inspect the skin for pallor, darkening of the nipples, and in men, breast enlargement caused by changing hormone levels. Other findings may include muscle wasting, weakness, poor nutritional status, and in weight loss. All tend to occur late in the disease process. Diagnostic management, collect a UA and it will show red blood cells, decreased in the H&H &H values, hypercalcemia, increased erythrocyte sedimation rate, and increased levels of adrenocorticotropic hormone, your human corticotropic gonotrophic HCG, cortisol and renin and parathyroid hormones. With surgical exploration, a mass may be found. The mass and surrounding tissues may be outlined by CT with contrast or by MRI. Diagnosis requires a biopsy of the tumor, of course. Non-surgical management, radiofrequency, ablation can slow tumor growth. 
This is just a medical procedure where part of the tumor or other dysfunctional tissue is lasered using heat generated from high frequency alternating current to treat a medical disorder after MRI has precisely located that tumor. Recently, two targeted therapy agents, Nexavar, N-E-X-A-V-A-R, or Toracel, T-O-R-I-S-E-L, were approved as treatments for patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma. Surgical management usually treated surgically by nephrectomy. Renal cell tumors are highly vascular and blood loss during surgery is a major concern. Before surgery, the artery supplying the kidney may be occluded or embolized by radiation to reduce bleeding during that removal of that kidney. Preoperative, you always want to explain the site of incision and the presence of dressings, drains, catheters, the PCA pump and other equipment after surgery because you don't want them to wake up and be shocked. Reassure the patient about pain relief. Care before surgery may include giving blood and IV fluids and you must have a consent sign. Operative, the patient is placed on the side with the kidney to be removed up. Usually the opposite trunk is flexed to increase exposure of the kidney area. Removal of the 11th or 12th rib is needed to provide better access to that kidney. The entire kidney and all visible tumor, renal arteries and veins and fascia after tying off the ureter is removed. The adrenal gland is left intact. A drain may be placed in the wound before closure. When a radical nephrectomy is performed, local and regional lymph nodes are also removed. Radiation therapy may follow a radical nephrectomy. Postoperative nursing priorities are focused on assessing renal function to determine functioning in the remaining kidney managing pain, of course, and preventing any complication. Always assess for hemorrhage and adrenal insufficiency. Hemorrhage or adrenal insufficiency causes hypotension, decrease urine output, and altered level of consciousness. So you really need to monitor your patient for these clues. Assess urine output hourly for the first 24 hours after surgery. Urine output of 30 to 50 is acceptable. Output of less than 25 to 30 suggests decreased renal blood flow. The hemoglobin level and hematocrit levels and white blood cell count may be measured every 6 to 12 hours for the first day or two after surgery. Measure and record fluid intake and output strictly. Weigh the patient daily. Assess dressings and drains. Because of discomfort of deep breathing, the patient is at risk for atelectasis. Uh, fever, chills, thick sputum, or decreased breath sounds suggest pneumonia. Pain management after surgery usually requires opial analgesics for up to five days. Preventing complications focuses on infection and management of adrenal insufficiency. Antibiotics may be prescribed during and after surgery to prevent infection. The need for additional antibiotics is based on evidence of an infection. Assess the patient at least every out eight hours for manifestation of systemic infection or local wound infection. If the adrenal gland is removed, the patient may need to be on steroid therapy because one gland may not produce enough glucocorticoid steroid hormones. Kidney trauma. 
minor injury. Common causes could include falls, contact sports, and blows to the back or torso. Major injuries could be gunshot wounds, knife wounds, or motor vehicle crashes. Bleeding is extensive and surgical exploration is often needed. Obtain a health history. Ask about pain level and location. Take blood pressure, apical and peripheral pulses, respirations and temp. UA will show blood. H and H will be decreased. If infection is present, WBCs are increased. IV urography, this reveals the patency of the renal system. And CT, which will show location of injury and what is involved in the injury or order because then they will know what they will have to do. Non-surgical management, drug therapy, clotting factors for bleeding such as vitamin K, fluid therapy to replace the circulating blood volume and be assured of adequate renal flow. You would use normal saline, D5 and a half normal saline and LR. During fluid replacement, monitor rate, assess patient for shock, vital signs are taken every 10 to 15 minutes, measure I's and O's strictly, urine output should be greater than 30 milliliters an hour. Surgical management, nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy may be needed. And then community-based care, uh, assess for infections or any other complications, check the patency and frequency uh, of urination and to note whether the color, clarity, and amount appear normal, chills, fever, lethargic, or cloudy, foul-smelling odor indicates infection, Seek medical care promptly if anything out of the ordinary happens. And if you look on page 1371, the action alert, this is very important, especially ER nurses that's going to be down in the ER. If the urethra opening is bleeding, consult with a urologist or the healthcare provider before attempting urinary catheterization to avoid making the injury worse. That is neon blinking off your page.